Hey everybody, I'm Karen, engineer on the Android Developer Relations team. And today, I want to spend some time to talk about accessibility and Compose. So we're going to start by talking about the different ways to think about accessibility for your app and how Android Framework enables apps to be more accessible for a wide range of users. Then building off of that, we're going to talk about how Compose was built with accessibility in mind from the start and how you can make your Compose apps more accessible. Finally, we'll end with a couple of best practice tips that you can keep in mind in the future as you're developing apps. All right, so to start off, I wanted to give a quick overview on the different ways to think about accessibility. The first aspect to consider is the design of your app. So this means making sure that all the elements in your app are easily visible and interactable. And this is important because it makes it more accessible for all the users in your app. Another aspect to consider when thinking about accessibility is whether your app works well with the different assistive technologies. So sometimes we forget that not everybody interacts with the device the same way. And sometimes users may be using devices like keyboards or services like screen readers to help them interact with their device. So when you're considering accessibility for your app, it's important to also consider whether your app works well with these different types of services and devices. So today's talk, we're mostly going to be focusing on the assistive technology side so that we can build a better understanding of how our Android apps interact with accessibility services and how you can make your apps to be more accessible for the wide range of users your app has. All right, so the best way to start thinking about supporting the variety of users in your app is by looking at the different ways a user can interact with an app. So here we have a simple app with a checkout button, and we're gonna look at the different ways a user can interact with this checkout button. The first and most common way that I think we're all familiar with is by tapping on the checkout button. However, sometimes a user may be using TalkBack to interact with their device and therefore your app. So TalkBack is a screen reader that helps users with vision impairments navigate their device. Using TalkBack, users can interact with the device using swipes and gestures and hear spoken announcements about what's displayed on the screen. Um, so if a user was using TalkBack to interact with our app here, they would navigate to the checkout button with swipes, and then they would hear the announcement checkout button, double tap to activate, and then they could double tap anywhere on the screen to activate the checkout button. Voice access is another accessibility service that some users use to help them access their device. Voice access allows users to control their device with spoken commands. So if a user was using voice access to interact with our app here, they would give the voice command tap checkout, and similarly, that would activate the checkout button. So here we've seen three different ways to interact with the checkout button here, but of course there are many other different ways that the user may be interacting with this app based on which accessibility service they're using. So the question now becomes, as an Android developer, we only built our simple app in one way, and we didn't really think about how it would interact with these different accessibility services. So how does that actually work? Well, most of the work starts in Android framework. So what Android Framework does is it takes a look at your app and it translates it in a way that allows different accessibility services to adapt your app based on the user's needs. In order to do this, what it does is it creates a tree of nodes that reflects what's currently displayed on the screen. And each of these nodes is referred to as an accessibility node info. So accessibility node info contains a lot of details about that specific node, but I want to highlight two of the most important pieces of information it contains. The first is the label. So for example, the content description that you set on an image button to describe the purpose of the button. The label is really important because it allows users to understand the purpose of each element in your app. The second is the set of actions that are available on an element. So for example, for every element, we need to know whether there are actions like tap or long click, or if it's some kind of text view, is there an edit action available? Um, the actions allow accessibility services to know how the user can interact with the element. And you probably have never needed to think about accessibility node info or the properties contained inside it, mostly because these properties are filled in automatically for you if you're using built-in components. So for example, the framework autom uh, automatically populates the label text field for text elements and certain actions for specific widgets like the switches or radio buttons. And so it's with all this information that then allows TalkBack to make announcements based on the element's label and available actions. 
And similarly, because of all this info that Accessibility Note info contains, um, accessibility services are then able to navigate and interact with apps. An Android framework creates this tree of Accessibility Note infos because it wants to help developers represent their app for accessibility services. But also, you as a developer have the capability to access the tree um, to create accessibility tools to support more users. All right. So now that we have a better understanding of how the framework works with your app to enable different accessibility services, we're going to dive into how this all translates in Compose. We're going to start at the beginning at what happens when you create composable functions. So when you create composable functions and the composable is evoked, a composition is created to describe your UI. As part of the composition, a semantics tree is also generated. So this semantics tree is especially important for us in this talk because it contains all the information about the meaning of each node. And some of the information it contains includes the label of each element, the actions that each element has, or what kind of component it is. And similar to the old view system where accessibility node infos were automatically populated for you if you're building uh, using built-in components, the semantics tree is also automatically generated if you're using components from the Combo's foundation library or the material library. And so it's with the semantics tree that the accessibility node info tree is then able to be generated that is then able to power accessibility services. What this means is that composables with no meaning are not included in the semantics tree, which is then not seen by access, uh, any accessibility services. So here's a more concrete example where we have a composable with a column. Um, the composable includes a button, an image, and a box. So the button has an on-click action associated with it, so it has some kind of meaning, so it's included in the semantics tree. The box has a content description or a label included with it. Uh, that means it also has some kind of meaning, so it's also included in the semantics tree. However, the image, as you see, is only associated with the drawable. That means it has no meaning uh, in terms of actions or labels, and therefore it's not included in the semantics tree, and therefore not seen by accessibility services at all. And the reason that Compose doesn't include elements with no semantics is because omitting these type of elements with no meaning improves the navigation for users of accessibility services. This allows them to more easily navigate through your app by interacting only with the meaningful elements. Uh, what this means is that sometimes Compose finds the need to merge nodes. So um, sometimes Compose merges nodes by grouping certain content together to enable easier navigation. And this is automatically applied for things inside a list. So any items inside a list are auto automatically merged. And also ele any elements inside a composable with a clickable modifier are also automatically merged. Um, sometimes you might find the need to specify your own merging behavior for your composables. So a more concrete example, as we see here, is an element with a drawable and some text. So if we don't specify our own merging behavior in this example, Accessibility services will see these three elements um, separately as the image and the two pieces of text. However, because it might make sense to group all this content together, something we might consider doing is to set the merge descendants property to true. That will allow accessibility services to see this element as a whole instead. Um, and similar to what we talked about before, another way to achieve the same result is by adding a clickable modifier to this whole element rule in order to merge it all together. But something to keep in mind is that if you're specifying, mer uh, specifying merging behavior, uh, descendants that are set for merging are not merged with its parents, which might be kind of hard to parse. So let's take a look at an example. So here we have uh, a clickable button, the bookmark, inside a card, which also has its own clickable action. As we mentioned before, if you apply cl a clickable modifier to an item, it automatically merges them. But here, since the bookmark button has its own click action, um, it doesn't want to be merged with the card that would get rid of the click action of the bookmark. So here, the bookmark button preserves its own click action, and the card also preserves its own click action. Something else to consider when you're specifying merging behavior is semantics properties. The first is that semantics are additive. And that means that when you group together composables, all their semantics are combined. So here is a more concrete example. This is the one that we looked at last time where we grouped all the elements together because they made sense to be grouped together with the clickable modifier. 
So something we might consider doing to take it a step further is then add a content description to the image. When we add the content description to the image, it will be combined with the labels of the text because it's all part of the row. If you can't achieve the desired behavior just by adding semantics properties, sometimes you might need to use the clear and set semantics uh, method instead. So going back to our last example, after we merge it, we might find the need to specify the order in which the content description is read aloud. So for that specific use case, we could use the clear and set semantics method to further specify how we want the content description to be laid out. And if you ever want to take a closer look at the semantics tree for your composables, you can always use the layout inspector in Android Studio. And for each node in the semantics tree, the layout inspector will show you the specific semantics set on that node. Similarly, you could also use the print to log method in your compose test to log the full semantics tree and see it printed out. Uh, but the important thing to remember here is that if you're using components, they support accessibility out of the box. So you hopefully don't have to worry about most of this. If you're building your own custom components, however, such as your own radio button or your own checkboxes, that's when you want to pay closer attention to accessibility support. And a good way to do that is to check out the material components com implementation to better understand how to utilize the Compose Foundation library that does have the accessibility support to build off of that. Um, and a more concrete example is, for example, if you wanted to build your own text field, a good way to start would be looking at how the text field is built in Material 3 based on the basic text field from the Compose Foundation library. All right, so to wrap it all up, we're going to end with a few general accessibility best practice tips to keep in mind for the future. The first is to design for accessibility. So if you consider accessibility from the start, this builds solid foundations for your app to support accessibility in the long run. Next, always remember to label your elements. Having concise and precise labels helps all your users understand the purpose of each element. And finally, if you can, always try to manually test. Testing your app with an accessibility service such as TalkBack helps you understand the areas for improvement. As always, we're listening to your feedback. So if you have any suggestions about how to improve Compose and accessibility, feel free to file an issue. And that's it for me. Thanks for listening to this talk, and thanks for your interest in accessibility. <laughs>